Here, here's why some people would deny not just the existence of Jesus, but the authority of Jesus as well, which is really at the heart of this problem. If Jesus said what he said in the scriptures, if that's an accurate record of what Jesus taught, and if Jesus actually died on the cross to pay the price for the sins of all humanity, <clears throat> and if Jesus did rise from the dead, and if he did ascend to heaven, and he's waiting there for us, then we owe him something. We owe him our loyalty. We owe him our lives. And this is why not everybody wants to accept the reality that Jesus Christ came here to earth. Or they deny his authority. Because uh, they don't want to be loyal to him. They don't have to live by his teachings. And the easiest way to avoid loyalty to Jesus Christ is to deny that he existed. If he's a well, then there's nothing to believe in, nothing to do, no responsibility, no accountability, those kinds of things. And so if he never came here to earth, or if he really is not who the Bible says that he is, then we get to be our own gods. We get to do whatever we want. We get to live in any way that we want. We get to be loyal only to ourselves. That is the problem that John addresses in Second John. The same issue in Second Peter, and it'll come up again in Third John next week. And to deny the reality of Christ and the authority of his teaching is dangerous. Uh, it's lazy. Uh, there are eternal consequences that cannot be remedied or reversed. And so the, e the, 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 the easiest way to escape the responsibility to Christ is to, to deny that he existed. The second easiest way is to uh, uh, deconstruct his words, his teaching, and make it mean whatever you might want it to mean. So let's move on from here. The theme of Second John is avoiding false teachers. I think the problem here is with my mic. I think it's my connection on my wireless I'm not going to mess with it. We're just going to leave it. Uh, the, so avoiding false teachers is the theme of uh, Second John. The key verse is found in verse 9. Anyone who goes too far and does not remain in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who remains in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. And so... Uh, it brings us to the little cartoon, the little graphic from Walk Through the Bible Ministries. It's available every week. Some of you were alert enough last week to know that one person yawning is one yawn, First John, and you anticipated correctly that for Second John there would be two people yawning. So very good. What's with the door? You got to shut the door, lock the door against false teachers. That comes up, I'll show you the verse in just a moment. Shut the door. Lock it. Don't let him in. Here's why. Verses 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, the teaching of Christ and his authority, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting for the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Keep them out of your house. Physically and metaphorically. Your life, that's, what, that's what's uh, being said here. So the big problem in this little letter, once again, is the danger of false teaching. And we're going to look at what is false teaching, why is it dangerous, how do we recognize it, and how do we avoid it? That's where we're going in this short little letter of Second John. Let's take a look at the first point. Number one is this, I must walk in truth. I must walk in truth. Verse 4 says this, I was overjoyed to find some of your children walking in truth. And here's, here's an important word. John recognized that some were walking in truth. Not all. There were some in the church to whom he was writing that were not walking in the truth. And that's why he wrote this letter, this note. We learned recently that to walk means your lifestyle, your values, your commitments, your behaviors. 
And any, listen carefully, any Christian who is not walking in truth is vulnerable to false teachers and false teaching. So the big question that we need to understand as we're working through this short little letter is, what is false teaching and what is truth? Because we measure any other teaching against truth. And what is truth and how do we walk in it? And that's where the next two verses come in. Verse 5 and 6. John writes this, I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. Now, John is writing, he's, he's making this comment to a lady. Now, it's not a woman, not a single person. He's making a reference to a church. And uh, he is using uh, polite yet firm language. And notice that he's making a request. He's not giving a command. He's making a request that uh, we would all, as a part of this church, this family, this lady, so to speak, that we would all be walking in the truth. Now, he uses this word lady because in the scriptures... The church, the word church, it's a feminine word. And feminine pronouns are attached to the church. Her, she, hers. And sometimes a, a, another word for a church is the bride of Christ. So he's using this feminine vocabulary to address a group of people called the church. In fact, we saw earlier that John was concerned that some of your children are not walking in truth. So children of the lady would be church members, Christians, believers, people who know Jesus Christ, who are legitimately a part of the family of God, the church, and they're not walking in the truth. It happens. It's a problem. And John wrote this letter to remedy that problem. So as I said a moment ago, uh, he's being respectful. He's being gentle. He's being firm, and that's uh, and, and by the, the way that he wrote these words, he's saying this in essence. I want you to be intentional about this. I want you to find ways to make this happen. Walking in the truth, walking in the commandments of Jesus Christ has been a priority from the beginning, and it ought to remain that way. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 22, Verses 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is it's the greatest commandment, Jesus said. This is the great and foremost commandment of all the commandments. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commandments, to love God and to love people, Hang the whole law and prophets. Everything found in the Old Testament scriptures can be summarized by these two laws. Vertical love for God, horizontal love for one another. So to walk in truth means that we love God and we love others, simply stated. That's our lifestyle, that's our habit, that's, that's what we do. We love God and we love others. So we go back to 2 John, verses 5 and 6. You see this phrase here? This is love that we walk according to his commandments. We walk according to his commandments. And what are the commandments? To love God and to love one another. Vertical love for God, horizontal love for others. Listen carefully. This is super important. These two commandments, to love God and to love others, is the antidote to false teachers into false teaching. Why? Because false teachers love themselves. Their first love is themselves. We're going to see that in the very last verse we're going to look at this morning. They love themselves more than they love God. If they love God, they would teach his word accurately. If they loved others, they would teach it accurately. 
But they don't love God the way they should. They don't love others the way they should. They love themselves. And so this is at the heart of false teachers and false teaching. And there's, there's something here really practical for us. And it relates to more than just church. It relates to where you work. It relates to, I don't know if anybody here is dating anybody. I think, you know, several are married, several are not. But the idea that if there's anybody in your life anywhere who wants you to disobey God and they're pressuring you to compromise in any way, uh, it's because they love themselves more than they love you. They're using you to their advantage. So be aware of that. You don't have to be a formal teacher in a church to be a false teacher. Anybody who pressures pressures anybody to compromise God's word and to compromise obedience to the scriptures is a false teacher. They're not presenting, proclaiming, living the truth, nor do they want it for anybody else. Here's the thing. If you truly love somebody, you want God's best for them. If you truly love yourself, it doesn't matter what other people do, just as long as they're there to please you. That's at the heart of false teaching. That's it. So if somebody's encouraging you or seducing you or expecting you to do something contrary to the truth, you've found a false teacher. And we're going to see, um, John says, shut the door. Don't let him in. Stay away. He should not be a part of your life. Stay away. Number two, I must watch myself. Verse 8, watch yourselves. That's where I got the idea for the outline point. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Now, John is not saying here that the reward is your salvation, that you can lose your salvation. If that's what he was saying, that would contradict everything else the Scripture says about salvation. It cannot be lost once it has been received. So what is it that can be lost? Well, the way that you find the answer to questions as you're reading the scriptures is to look at that verse you're examining, read it in its context. What are the verses before? What are the verses after have to say about that particular statement that you're reading at this particular time? And in the broader context of verse 8, he is talking about uh, those that are, who are spiritually deceptive. Here's, here's verse 7. This is the prior verse. It sets up the context. Many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Now, I've said already this morning that very few people today deny that Jesus Christ appeared in the flesh. But as we looked at in 2 Peter, and it's really at the heart of what we're looking at here again today in 2 John, uh, it's not the person of Jesus, it's the authority of Jesus. And people will deny the existence of Christ because that's their way of denying the authority of Jesus. And some just come right out and say, they don't say it, but if you watch and if you listen, they don't have a problem with talking about Jesus. They just don't obey him. They have a problem with his authority. That's the mark of a false teacher. So what is it that can be lost? He says here, do not lose what we have accomplished. I believe what he's talking about in the context here. Uh, Let me just back up and first of all say, uh, when he talks about the deceiver and the antichrist, He's not talking about the ultimate villain that shows up during the tribulation. He's talking about anybody even today, even back in John's day. Anybody who is opposed to Christ, to the reality of his existence, to the authority of his teachings, is opposed to Christ. They are an antichrist. So it's not like this guy with horns and stuff. It might be very attractive, very charismatic, very personable, you know, individual who has a lot of charisma and, you know, people love this person. Um, 
It doesn't matter how the person sounds and what the person looks like. It matters what the person is saying and what the person is expecting. So what is it that can be lost? I believe it's loyalty to Jesus. He's saying, don't lose your loyalty to Jesus like the false teachers have. Because this is what we've gained. This is what we've built up. This is what we've accomplished. This is what a church is about. Loyalty to Christ alone. And this is why false teachers are not a part of God's plan for the church. Because they are disloyal. To God, to Christ, to the Spirit of God, and to the Word of God. So that's why John is saying here that false teachers need to be shown the door. Shut them out. They're not to be a part of your life. Because, listen carefully, if they are not dealt with properly, the church will lose its focus. The church will lose its loyalty. The church will lose its momentum. And so in the church, there is to be no tolerance, zero, none, for anyone who distorts the word of God to his or her own advantage. Zero tolerance for that. So the problem existed. Did I just lose my mic? No? Really? Okay, I'm not. Can you hear? All right. Apologize. We're still still getting this sorted out. The problem in, in, in John's day existed with people losing their loyalty to Jesus because others were distorting the word of God to their own advantage. The problem still exists. They either deny the reality of Jesus, but they always deny the authority of Christ. Always. That's just a mark. So as I said a moment ago, a false teacher doesn't have a problem with the person of Jesus in, in a contemporary culture. It does have a problem with his, his authority. And he says, the reason we want you to be careful is so that you don't lose your full reward. Um, what is the full reward? Oh, I want you to know, first of all, that God is in the business of rewarding faithfulness. That's what he loves to do. And that theme is repeated throughout the scriptures. Here's what Jesus said. He told a parable about a master who gave his servants responsibilities. And in the context of that story, he said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. What's Jesus saying? God will reward you as well for your faithfulness, your loyalty to him. That's the point of Jesus' teaching here. We also read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8. Each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. You look at the broader context of this verse, and you'll see that some will receive many rewards that will last eternally. Some will receive few, if any, because of the lack of loyalty, lack of faithfulness to Jesus Christ. So the full reward, I think probably the best way to explain it, would be the maximum return on investment for your faithfulness to Jesus Christ. Your maximum return on investment because you're walking with Christ day by day. That return on investment is realized in this life and it's realized in the life to come. There are rewards, there are benefits for being faithful to Jesus today. And those rewards will be carried with you into eternity as well. So, uh, we need to watch ourselves. We need to protect ourselves from false teachers and false teaching. And we're going to finish up by asking, answering the question, how do we do that? How do we protect ourselves? Now, if we just did a biblical survey from Genesis to Revelation, we would find many, many, many bits of advice and clear, direct instruction about how to avoid false teachers, how to avoid false teaching. 
But I'm going to stay in the context of 2 John because he tells us one thing to do. Actually, there are, there are two commands. There are two things he says in one verse. And, and this is John's advice to us about how to avoid false teachers and avoid false teaching. Number three, I must shut the door. I must shut the door. Verses 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, love God, love one another. The authority of Jesus Christ is supreme. Don't lose your focus. Don't lose your loyalty. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting for the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. So it says here, here's the first command. Here's the first thing John says about how to avoid a false teacher and false teaching. Do not receive him into your house. To receive means this. To welcome someone, to establish a relationship, or to maintain a relationship. That's what it means to receive. Let me give you a couple of biblical examples. First John, or excuse me, John 1.12 says this. As many as received him, Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God. This is a salvation verse. And what he's saying here is anyone who has welcomed Christ and has established a relationship with him and is now maintaining a relationship with him is a child of God. So we receive Christ. We welcome him into our lives. That's what it means to receive. Here's another one. Jesus said this in John 14, 3. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What's he saying? We have a relationship, and I'm going to maintain that relationship with you. I'm leaving, but that doesn't mean that we're over. I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'm going to receive you. I'm going to maintain that relationship with you so that we will be together always and enjoy our fellowship, our relationship, our love for one another always. So with that understanding of what it means to receive, we go back to 2 John. He says, do not receive that person into your house. Now this is just a little bit technical here. The word your is singular. It's not y'all. I know, Dennis. Yeah. So what, what I, the, here's the distinction. This is why I say that. Because some would say, oh, we're not supposed to let them into our church. No, that would be y'all's house. It's not y'all's house. It's your home. It's your life. It's you as an individual. This is an individual responsibility. Some of you really like it that I said y'all in church. Yeah, okay. It's your life. It's your home. It's your house. Chuck Swindoll wrote a book, Home, Where Life Makes Up Its Mind. So I want you to think about, when you read here, your house, I want you to think about any way, any place, any person, any influence that shapes your personal values that influences your lifestyle, that has an effect or an impact on your loyalty to Jesus Christ. If there is anything in your life that challenges your relationship to Christ, your loyalty to him, shut the door. Keep it out, whatever it might be. It could be people. It could be media. It could be what you read, what you hear what you see, what you think. It could be a number of things. Shut the door. So those, and he's talking about those in the church who are disloyal to the authority of Jesus. Those who are disloyal to the teaching of Jesus are to be kept away from your house. 
literally and metaphorically. Shut the door. Anything that influences the way that you choose to live, shut the door. We'll talk more about this during Flock Talk because I know it raises a lot of questions. And that's okay. Number two, here's the second thing he tells us to do. Do not give him a greeting. Do not give him a greeting. So it's no hello. It's no shalom. It's no aloha. Why? This is how conversations start. This is how relationships begin, with a greeting. John's saying, close your mouth. Close the door. Don't say anything to him. Avoid them. Stay away from them. He's, he's being real strong here. Why would he say this? Because uh, he, this is, for the one who gives him a greeting participates in his... This word participates is literally fellowships. You're fellowshipping with somebody who denies the authority of Jesus Christ, and that is going to taint, influence, poison, perhaps, your loyalty to Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul warned, bad company corrupts good morals. Stay away from it. You can't do this. So he's saying, distance yourself from anyone or anything that would undermine or overrule the authority of Jesus Christ and the teaching of Jesus Christ. So when that person, that influence, whatever it is, comes knocking on the door, whether it's literally or metaphorically, keep the door closed. Don't open that door. Don't even engage in a conversation. Stay away. He's saying, guard yourself against those who oppose the truth. Those who oppose the authority of Jesus Christ. One example, one illustration, we're going to wrap it up with this. In Acts chapter 20, the Apostle Paul <clears throat> is speaking to the leadership of the church in Ephesus. At the time, the large, second largest city in the world. Ephesus was the size of Tacoma. And Timothy had planted, uh, and Paul had planted a church there. Paul is on his way to ultimately to die in Rome. And he spoke to the leaders and he, he warned them about this. <clears throat> Be on guard, sounds familiar. For yourselves, sounds familiar. For all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from speaking among your own selves, men will arise. People inside the church, even among the leadership. He's speaking to leaders. Speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them, therefore be on the alert. He starts and he ends this statement with this warning to watch yourselves. Watch yourselves. Why would anybody in the church rise up and distort the word of God to his or her own advantage and draw people away? Right here. To draw people away. Power and control. That's it. That is an incredibly difficult uh, temptation to resist. Power and control. And uh, John is saying, and I wish I'd learned this earlier, shut the door. Shut it. Don't let it happen. It's dangerous. Have nothing to do with those who challenge and distort the Word of God to his or her own advantage by compromising the authority of Jesus Christ in your life and in our lives. And so here's the ultimate solution. It's our takeaway, uh, suggested takeaway. I will walk with Jesus. He's the one I'm going to follow. He's the authority in my life. 
He is my shepherd. And Second John 6 says, walk according to his commandments. Vertical relationship with God, horizontal relationship with one another. Let's pray. Father, Second John, short little book. There's so much more that could be said. But we've had a chance to scan it this morning. And I thank you for its contents. I thank you that it's practical and relevant today, even though the actual situation was a little bit different in John's day. The principles are the same. That the teachings of Jesus Christ to love you and to love one another, that's the the commandments. That's the original commandments. That's the heart of the Old Testament. It's the heart of the New Testament. It's your heart, God. And that's why this... This phrase is repeated so often. It's why John kept coming back to these commandments, that we would walk in them, that loving you would be priority one. Loving others would be priority two. And we've seen and we understand that false teachers and false teaching is all about loving self. And uh, that's just backwards. It's upside down. It's not at all where it needs to be. So, Father, I pray that you would help each one of us as individuals prevent this false teaching from coming into our homes, not just our literal physical places where we live, but even in our mind, our heart, our ears, anything that influences our devotion to you and our loyalty to your Son that we would shut the door, keep it out. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's say goodbye to our friends who are online, and then we're going to sing for a little bit. Adios.